On this week's Nesson Patriots podcast, we are joined by Andrew Callahan of MassLive.com. We will discuss everything that happened in Super Bowl 53. Welcome to the Nesson Patriots Podcast. I am Doug Kai, joined as always by Zach Cox. Zach, how are you doing? I'm tired, Doug. I'm very <laughs> tired. We've been in, in Atlanta for eight days now. I think this is our eighth day. I've lost uh, track. Been a long week, a lot of late nights. Last night was a particularly late night, but it's fun, man. This is the third year in a row that we're doing this day after Super Bowl podcast, and I don't know, this is always one of my favorite ones of the year, so I'm excited to get into it. Yep, playing the role of Rich Hill this this year around is Andrew Callahan <laughs> of MassLive.com. Andrew, how are you doing? Uh, now I'm a little worried because I've never met Rich, though, <laughs> though I follow him on Twitter and he's a very great follow, so I don't know how exactly to emulate him, but we're, we're going <laughs> to give it a shot here. Yeah, no, it's okay. You don't have to be exactly like Rich. I, like, I, I like you a lot, Andrew. I don't know if you're quite as nice as Rich Hill. Rich Hill is one of the nicest people. Like, you are nice. Is he like Reese, Mike Reese level nice? Close. He's close, yeah. yeah. He, he's very he's nice. like goat standard. Yeah, he's Mike. like he's like Mike Reese, Field Yates level nice. Um, but no, you're a nice guy too, so Thanks. that's why we're having you on here. Okay. Um, so in case you were living under a bridge on Sunday night, the Patriots won Super Bowl 53. Uh, is, is, it, is it under a, does under a bridge work there? I don't know. I think it was under a rock. Under a rock. I guess you could a rock live, under if, a bridge. If you're living yes. under a bridge, you probably don't have, have Listen, access. Yeah, clearly, we, okay, we've already established Zach and I are not as nice as the bridge. We would have probably let that slide. It's been a very long week. <laughs> oh. I think I got like 20 hours of sleep total over the last eight days, uh, including last night. There was about a food poisoning involved there, which I won't get into. Uh, but that is why I'm so tired. But the Patriots did win their sixth Super Bowl. Uh, that's the six for Tom Brady, six for Bill Belichick. Multiple 14 Patriots now on the current team have won three Super Bowls or more, which is pretty unbelievable. And let's first get into, uh, as I was talking to some people last night, I've been reading some stuff this morning, people seem to think that this game was boring. And I guess I can sort of understand it to some degree, and maybe it's because I sometimes have a hard time seeing the forest for the trees. But I thought last night's game was like pretty entertaining, if only because... Obviously, it was a defensive game, but there was enough big defensive plays with the interceptions and sacks that I thought it moved pretty quickly for me. Yeah, I think there are two parts to this, one of which is the expectations, I think, universally, where Mm -hmm. this was going to be a high-scoring game, fireworks everywhere. We didn't get fireworks. The only touchdown was a two-yard run by Sony Michelle behind a jumbo package where everyone in the world knew what they were going to do. So because it felt to meet those expectations, naturally feels a little bit boring. Uh, secondarily, I think you're right on the part of the Patriots' defense against the Rams' offense. That was outstanding defense. Yeah. Like there, there's no issue. Goff didn't make some, you know, he, he made some poor plays, but overall, I think the Patriots took away from the Rams instead of the Patriots' offense, right. which really kind of stumbled its way downfield. Their first yeah. four drives get to the 40, they only get three points. So part of it was bad offense, but more so just you know this fireworks show we expected didn't really materialize. Yeah, it was a very, uh, very different situation than what we saw in each of the last two Patriots Super Bowls. Mm-hmm which basically were team I think both teams had 28 or more points in in both of those games. Um so this was obviously the polar opposite of that, but I thought it was entertaining as well. I mean, I don't know if I'm a little biased just because we were at the stadium, we were so kind of like fully locked in. Maybe if this was a a situation where I'm at a, a Super Bowl party and right. you kind of you space out a little bit when it's just punt after punt after punt, but I agree with you. I don't think it was offensive ineptitude. That was kind of the story of this game. I think it, it was the case for a lot of the game with the Patriots, but mm-hmm. even the Patriots were able to move the ball pretty freely for most of the game. They just end up kind of ended up kind of shooting themselves in the foot late in drives with with some some interceptions and some kind of blown opportunities there at the end. But overall, just watching this Patriots defense was pretty thrilling, honestly. Just the way that they were able to pressure Jared Goff, the way that they were able really able to completely and totally neutralize. One of, if not the best offenses in the entire NFL this season, with what many people believe to be the kind of the coach of the future in Sean McVay. Yeah, it was it was remarkable. I I can't say that I saw it coming. I, I was saying all week that I did expect the Patriots <coughs> to win this game, but I thought it was at least going to be in the high twenties for both teams, if not higher. And so I I was not expecting this kind of throwback slugfest <laughs> at all. I mean, it was, a, it was the lowest scoring Super Bowl in NFL history, yeah. Yeah, which I, is incredible to happen in 2019. And the Patriots really strayed away from what they did all season defensively in this game. Uh, coming into the game, they led the NFL in man coverage rate, 
and he came out really pretty heavily in zone, at least on first and second down in this game. You saw Jonathan Jones playing safety. You saw J.C. Jackson covering tight ends. Uh, Patrick Chung was playing linebacker, which he's he's done before. That's not the biggest wrinkle, but Jonathan Jones playing safety was like a huge wrinkle that I certainly didn't expect, and it basically made them play with two cornerbacks for a lot of the game with just Jason McCourty and stuff on Gilmore. And then obviously that plays in with, with, the, with the zone coverage where Jonathan Jones has played so much slot, he's played so much cornerback that he can basically do cornerback like things from that safety position in zone coverage. And I've got some theories on why Jones played safety and why they played so much zone coverage. And actually uh, there was kind of an interesting quote from Devin McCourty that I collected last week about why the Patriots played so much man coverage over the season. And Devin McCourty was basically saying that quarterbacks are so good at this point that you can't play zone coverage against a lot of them because they just know how to pick their spot. So it's almost kind of telling that you play against Jared Goff, you come out in zone coverage, and they only give up three points in that game. As far as Jones playing safety goes, I do think he's probably a better run defender just because of his slot experience uh, than Deron Harmon and J.C. Jackson. And he's got the speed to still kind of keep up with Robert Woods on crossing routes, but it was still a, a huge twist that I certainly did not expect them to put Jones at safety over a guy like Daron Harmon, who's been such a good player for this team for so many years. Have the Patriots just been like saving Jonathan Jones for the <laughs> biggest games of the season? Because it's been it's been incredibly surprising to see his sort of rise over the last couple of weeks. I mean, he was a guy that that played a, a pretty consistent role on this team for two and a half seasons, at least a season and a half. He, right. he was either their, their number three corner or their number four corner. He would end up playing a, a pretty high number of defensive snaps every game. But second half of this season, after J.C. Uh, JC Jackson sort of elevated into that, that kind of starting rotation, we really didn't see much of Jonathan Jones at all on defense until the AFC Championship game, where, where he was used to cover primarily to cover Tyreek Hill in that game, played almost every defensive snap. And then last night, I think he played all but one defensive snap yeah. mm -hmm. at safety, which is a position that we haven't seen him play since he entered the NFL. And it's, I don't know, they must have, I, I'm, I'd be interested to hear or to, to find out when the Patriots kind of identified that this is something that Jonathan Jones can do, just because we haven't seen it right. before, whether this was something that, that they kind of discovered within that two-week break between the AFC Championship game and the, the Super Bowl, or, or whether this is something that they kind of had in their back pocket and they say, okay, if we if we need to pull this out, we might pull this out down the line. And and he played well. I mean, for a, yeah. an undersized yeah. guy, he was playing very physical. You, you'd see him kind of tearing downhill in, in a lot of these running situations, playing a lot like we're used to seeing Patrick Chung play. And for, a, for again, an undersized slot corner who's known more for his, his coverage and his special teams ability and his pure speed than his kind of brute force out there, I, I was very impressed with what I saw from him. Yeah, and I think the usage of Jones, more so this week, but also some of the things they did against the Chiefs, speaks to the larger picture and story of this defense, which is they've just been able to flex into whatever look that they wanted to throughout the course of the season. And you've got one pro bowler who's excellent in what he does, and Stefan Gilmore, such a weapon where you go, hey, go grab that guy, eliminate him from the game, and then we can focus on the rest. But, you know, with Jones, I think you needed against the Chiefs some guy who could handle Tyreek Hill quickness in the short and intermediate areas. Being a slot guy, he naturally has that. But Hill was always going to get doubled because the problem isn't just his quickness, it's the long speed. Now, this week was really different. Obviously, we talked about the zone coverage because you have to account for those tight splits where the Rams create so much traffic with all their different routes, you just can't keep up in man coverage all the time. But what they were able to do from what I saw was kind of mix the zone, but they kind of had man principle. So right. once the routes declared themselves, Jones being back there was essentially man coverage, or they'd have brackets on Robert Jones. So it's a double team, and then Gilmore has cooks, and you're really not worried about any deep balls because mm -hmm. as Belichick said post game, we need to take care of the run game and the play action passes. So if you've got more corners on the field, as you said, not a Deron Harmon who maybe not isn't as great against the run and certainly isn't as good in man to man coverage, you know, with Jonathan Jones there instead you really have you know, a full complement of defenders who can do multiple things. And even when Chung goes out, Harmon gets down there, plays a similar role, and then gets the pressure to force basically the game-winning interception. Right, yeah, it was interesting once Chung went down because <clears throat> in talking to Devin McCourty after the game, what he said was that after Chung broke his arm, he actually had to go over to Brian Flores and say, like, hey, what the hell are we going to do right now? Because... <laughs> I because usually if Patrick Chung goes down in the game, he was explaining that like he basically just takes over that strong safety role. But he said to Flores like I can't do what he's doing right now because he's playing linebacker. So essentially, what they had to do 
was split Patrick Chung's role into two different players. Elaine and Roberts started playing a lot more snaps, and Daron Harmon started playing a lot more snaps. And it was kind of nice, you know, Daron Harmon really has seen his snaps reduced over the last couple of weeks, so it was actually kind of nice to see him make two big plays in that game. He's sort of been the anti-John Jones in that right. respect. Yeah. He, he made the, or I guess it was actually technically Stephon Gilmore who made the pass breakup. I'm crediting it to Harmon. I'm giving it to Harmon. I don't, I, don't I don't know if Gilmore would have broken it up. If I don't know if he would, but Har- Gilmore was the one who got his hand on the ball. Harmon just came over and, and kind of knocked the crap out Finished of the Brian Cooks. Yeah. Um, and then on the next play, Daron Harmon brought pressure, and Stephon Gilmore made the game-clinching interception. And I guess we can get into that real quick. Uh, Gilmore said that it was basically the easiest interception of his career. It really was. I mean, uh, Jerry Post-game Goff. Steph is the, my favorite it, Patriots player. Like, it's not just Steph on Gilmore. It's post-game yes. Steph. I mean, this is Pre-game prob- Steph, not, in, not that great. Post-game Steph, yeah. awesome. He's yeah. honest. He's just not as old. Yeah. This is definitely like a little like inside football that most people probably don't care about. But talking to Stephon Gilmore, I think we talked about it on the podcast at times this year. Talking to him after <laughs> any sort of game yeah. is just hilarious because you get the total unvarnished truth the very very cocky truth often about usually it's how he feels about the opposing receiver that he just covered whether yeah. he he loves to push off or he's slow he was really he, nice to Brandon Cooks after re- really game. nice to Brandon mm-hmm. Cooks I tried to bait him <laughs> <laughs> not so much about not the first time this year either. <laughs> not, not so much about about Jared Goff he, he was asked uh, Gilmore it does a ton of media after, after every single game he's really accommodating he did Probably about fifteen oh media, God. fifteen yeah. media scrums after this game, and every time he was asked, like, "Go take me through that that interception," he was just like, "Yeah." I, the, my favorite quote on it, he was like, "Yeah, I saw the ball. I had my eyes on him the entire time. It was." He said, "What was he said? I can't believe he threw it." Right. And yeah. and according to Jason McCordy, he had told Gilmore had had told the team on the sideline or, the, or the, his fellow defensive backs on the sideline before that drive. He was saying, we know Jared Goff is going to throw us one. All we have to do is squeeze onto the ball and catch it, which kind of goes back to, to some of the comments that our, our buddy Mike Giardi reported early in the week that, that somebody on the Patriot, an anonymous Patriots player, said that, that Jared Goff was going to uh, blank his pants in this <laughs> game. And, and he did. I mean, Jared Goff was really sort of, I don't know if you would want to say he was exposed, but he definitely made some very big mistakes in some very important instances, especially that uh, that Stephon Gilmore interception. And we talked about, you know, the Patriots defense changing what it needed to do each week to, you know, kind of take away the opponent's strengths. And I think this week it was as much the run game and taking away Woods and Cooks. It was do as much as we can to put the game on Goff's shoulders because right. we think without all their strengths, run game, Cooks and Woods, but also McVay in his ear and how they've designed the offense where all that motion that you saw pre-snap generally creates openings in zone or creates you know man uh, receivers freed from man coverage. It didn't do that against the Patriots because they were prepared for it. So once you take away all those strengths from the coach on the sideline and the best receivers around him, Goff isn't as good as you might see a Tom Brady to distribute to your third and fourth receivers and be able to generate yards. So you saw him blank his pants, and that was, again, on play action where the first read wasn't there and he's got to throw it away. And, you know, he, he's not a terrible quarterback, but it looked representative or he mirrored the, the QB they saw in 2016 where they're coming in with that awful Jeff Fisher team. And it's just a guy where the Patriots, I think, said afterwards – you know, if we knew he's going to look at the rush. So as soon as we right. get there, the play's over. And yeah. that's what it was. 12 QB hits, four sacks, that was the night. And that was very big on the Stephon Gilmore interception, too, because I think that's part of the reason why Stephon Gilmore knew that Jared Goff was just going to chuck the ball in the air because yeah. Daron Harmon was really bearing down on him on that play. And and, and on that play, they blitzed both Daron Harmon and uh, Devin McCourty. Right. That was really the only kind of zero blitz they had yeah. in the entire game. And they're both running right at Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley can only pick up one of them. He ended up picking up McCourty. Daron Harmon basically gets a, a free shot at Jared Goff. He doesn't end up actually making contact, but yeah. you could tell. Basically, Jared Goff had to throw that off one foot and yeah. sort of rainbow it over Daron Harmon, and it just sort of fell right down to Stephon Gilmore. Yeah, and Brandon Cooks kind of overran it and... Couldn't come Brandon back Cooks and piece of the ball, but that's Brandon kind of, Cooks played a lot like the Brandon Cooks we saw last yeah. year. I mean, he actually wound up having a, a pretty big game. He had eight catches for 120 yards, Whoa. but I mean, he's not a guy who ever really makes contested catches. Well, yeah. and that was one where, I mean, I don't know. It felt like he could have come back for the ball a little bit better, but he had kind of overran the play at that point. Yeah. Which is kind of why it's exactly like the Brandon yeah. Cooks we saw last year, because he ended up with a thousand yards. But you just look and you see some kind of missed opportunities on the table with that be it the uh the Gilmore interception or, or the Jason McCourty uh play earlier in the game which mm-hmm. was much more on yeah. golf yeah. than on Cooks but yeah. you kind of want your your receiver to to 
fight for do that ball. Do something more for yeah. that ball. I mean, like, come back for it or, or fight for it or make that catch anyway, but... I heard those yeah. at 120 yards, and it sounds like empty calories to me. Like, I couldn't oh, tell you when yeah. all of that came through. I mean, they had 205 yards of offense going into that final drive. Yeah. It ended in a missed field goal. It was yeah. really just a futile attempt to get back in the game. I and, was shocked when I looked last night. He had right? And especially with Gilmore shadowing him, which I think speaks to, you know, and I know you do a great job of this, but also how tricky it is keeping coverage stats. Because right. you go, okay, Gilmore won that matchup. But, like... Well, Gilmore only allowed 48 of the... Right, because you've got zone in there, and, you know, yeah. it's, it's not always strictly on him, but... Um, yeah, I think in the instances where Goff finally was able to escape, it made a couple good throws. But right. like all those hundred twenty yards, you know, typically he might have that in half just on those big play action shots. But they were comeback routes or just you know kind of a garbage time at the end. Definitely, and it was a big game for the Patriots run defense. It's kind of amazing that after weeks fourteen and fifteen, we were all freaking out about the Patriots run defense, and really a lot of that was just due to the fact that they didn't really care to stop the run in those weeks. They were running a lot of dime defense, and they were basically allowing the Dolphins and the Steelers to run the ball in those games but ever since then when they've wanted to load up against the run they've done a fantastic job I think over the last five games I don't think they've allowed more than four yards per carry in this game they only allowed three and a half yards per carry Danny Shelton had a big game Lawrence Guy had a big game and it's it's kind of funny because Danny Shelton probably saved his best game for the last game of the season he had he had a pretty good uh quarterback pressure he had a huge run stuff he was kind of a, a force there in the middle of the defense but um Kyle Van Noy, Dante Hightower, really all across the board, the Patriots defense, you'd have a hard time finding a player who, who played poorly in that yeah, game. Yeah, Shelton hitting free agency, too. Definitely uh, picked a good <laughs> time to have, uh, yeah, like you said, his best game as a Patriot. Yeah, and I think it goes, too, to Hightower and Van Noy, who were so often on the edges there, where they're trying to get a six-man front to say, listen, if you want to run that kind of outside right. wide zone, like, go ahead, but we're going to meet beat you there. Yeah. So then you have to cut it back, and then you have a guy... In, in Shelton, who normally might struggle sometimes to handle two gaps or take on a double team, but because you have six guys up front, the Rams can't double team. Right. So you don't have many linebackers who can make the signals from the middle and play in the middle and then drop to the outside like Hightower Van Noy were doing. So, you know, right time for the D tackles to step up, but I think they were also put in a really great position because of the linebackers dropping down to play kind of like an extra defensive end spot. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, and it was a good game for the Patriots' pass rush as well. It was their third straight game where they have a pressure rate over 50%, which is, like, pretty incredible, especially for this defense. I think usually, like, the top defenses in the NFL have a pressure rate around, like, 35%. Maybe it gets up to 40 So, against the Chargers, Chiefs, and Rams, it's all been over 50%. And they really kind of mixed it around. Dante Hightower and Kyle Van Noy were the top pass rushers in the game just because they, they had three sacks between them. Uh, but really, all across the board, the Patriots are very good at, at rushing the passer. They also did blitz 20 times in this game, which is definitely more than they usually do. Uh, so they, they certainly knew the formula, like we were saying earlier, to kind of disrupt Jared Goff and, and to, to make that Rams offense kind of keep them on their toes a little bit out there. Yeah, they blitzed the hell out of them. They stunted and, and twisted. And basically, every or not every one of their pressures, but the vast majority of their pressures came on some sort of twist or stunt or game up front that, that left Hightower um, or, or Trey Flowers or Kyle Van Noy just kind of unblocked or, or against a, an offensive lineman that was just kind of off balance and couldn't really handle um, handle the pressure up there. Uh, I think, I mean, Dante Hightower and Kyle Van Noy were both fantastic in this game. They had they combined for half of the Patriots quarterback hits. They, they had three apiece. Uh, Hightower had two sacks. Kyle Van Noy had one sack. They were just in the backfield nonstop and a lot of people or some people were saying after the game that were griping a little bit with the fact that uh, the MVP went to Julian mm-hmm. Edelman who just who was great best. in this game yeah. he capped off a, a another phenomenal postseason hell of a year yeah hell of a year hell of a postseason hell of a really whatever you, a postseason career I guess you could call it <laughs> For sure. he's he's now second all time in in post postseason receptions and postseason yards but since this was such a dominant defensive effort, there were a lot of people that, that would have liked to see it either go to go to Hightower, go to Van Noy, go to Stephon Gilmore. I think uh, Hightower and Van Noy sort of split the vote between themselves, mm-hmm. I think, because they did have pretty similar games. And then maybe if, if Stephon Gilmore made, made one more play, I guess, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to... Take, take anything away from his game because he played a fantastic game but maybe if the Patriots recover that fumble that he forced or something like that maybe it goes the other way but yeah it's it's a good situation to be in if you if your team has kind of four guys that are all have very valid um, uh, MVP sort of 
Yeah, credential. Bids, whatever. bids, yeah, credential, yeah. 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 And, and I, Tom Brady wasn't one of them, which is not, no, not what we're used to seeing at all in these kind of games. Weird. And it's funny, I think the MVP usually speaks to like whatever game you're talking about, the finals of the World Series, like how the media, more to their judgment and their process of voting for it versus right. like what the actual impact was. Because you look at the stat sheet statistically, John Jones led in tackles with six, Stefan Gilmore had five, and then all the way down to the bottom, Hightower had two. Right. So if you're looking at that, even though you just watched the game for the entirety, you'd feel bad as a media member, oh, he only had two tackles. Yeah. But obviously it's not representative no. of what he did. With all the checks, all the calls, all the pressures, all the QB hits. So for them, it's, it's, we don't know quite how well to parse out all the defensive impacts and responsibility. But I agree, one of, the, one of them should have gotten it. Uh, and I think, I think we talked about this after. If he grabs that pick... That's like thrown right yeah. at him. He probably gets that because then statistically he's got a better case. Uh, but anyway, the, the most interesting part about this to me too was with all the stunts and, and the twists, you guys have obviously covered the team much longer than I have, this being my first year. But how much of an impact guys like, you know, Brendan Daly who's been here, but bringing in Flores as a new D coordinator, Joe Kim is working with the defensive line, Brett Bielma's in there. Like, Why was there such a jump this year and all the stunts and twists they were able to execute to get pressure? And guys were better. Trey Flowers is much better. Mm-hmm. Versus a year ago. I mean, they're, they're doing it so much more effectively. They're picking on these teams' pass protections where they didn't blitz the, blitz the Chargers a whole lot. They put mm-hmm. pressure on the Chiefs, but it was because they got them into third downs. Like, that's where the pass rush got so much better this year. But they, I, I, don't, I don't know what the difference was. I think, well, something that plays into that a little bit, too, is that they got better as the year progressed, too, because they weren't quite as good early in the season, at least from what I no. was charting and, and noticing. But then, yeah, over this playoff run, it's almost like it's almost like everything just clicked at the end of the season because they did have, I think, so many voices in that defensive line room, like you're saying, with Brett Bielma and Brendan Daly and Joe Kim, that, that maybe it just took some time to figure out what exactly was going to work here. Uh, but I think that, you know, bringing in those other voices, bringing in those other people and, and you know, just having Brian Flores maybe bring a little bit more creativity or, or mm. just a, a different voice than Matt Patricia had – I think that that's probably it's probably a lot of things that go into it. There's not one specific thing because I don't think that this Patriots front seven is among the most talented in the NFL. No. I think that you know Trey Flowers is great. Dante Hightower had a good season, but not a great season. Kyle Van Noy, I think, had a, a very good season, but it's not like you're talking about Von Miller or you know even looking at this Rams. You, you don't have Indomitian Sue and Aaron Donald. Right. Looking at the Chiefs, you don't have D Ford and Justin Houston and Chris Jones. So it, you're kind of getting by with you know I wouldn't say middling players, but but decent to good players by doing this. So I think it, it probably does have more to do with the defensive coaches than it really does the players who are able to execute what they were telling them to do. Yeah, and the biggest thing that we heard when, when Brian Flores took over was that he was going to kind of run a more aggressive scheme than Matt Patricia ran in all of his years here. And we didn't see that every week this year. There were long stretches where, where it wasn't very blitz-heavy, it wasn't very kind of super pressure-based, but I think he definitely they definitely had that sort of base in the in the defensive playbook that they could bring out when they needed to in games like this. And I think it also just helped that everybody stayed healthy. Yes. I mean, yeah. Trey yeah. Flowers got banged up very early in the year, but for the last three months, really, he was healthy. Dante Hightower played this entire season. Kyle Van Noy played this entire season. Really, everybody, every key member of that defense, other than Jawan Bentley, who hadn't even really <laughs> arisen to the level where, where he was kind of a, a locked-in starter before he got hurt, everybody else was available for this game. I mean, you were seeing pretty solid players, guys like Danny Shelton and, and Adrian Claiborne and Dietrich Wise yeah. just be healthy scratches late in the season because the Patriots just had so much depth up front and, and really throughout their defense. So I think that definitely helped being able to, one, have the, the, the talented players available themselves, and two, having them all together for the entire season because running these kind of creative blitz schemes and, and pass rush schemes with all the twists and all the crazy stuff up front. It's all communication between these guys. And if you have guys coming in the lineup, coming out of the lineup, working together for two weeks, and then he's, oh, he's out with a hammy, and then, oh, he's back, but this guy's out. Right. It's so hard to get that kind of cohesiveness up front. And I think having everybody healthy for basically the entire season really helped them in that regard, which is why they were so good in the playoffs. I mean, you mentioned pressure, pressure rate earlier. Their three playoff games were their three highest pressure mm-hmm. rates of the season. And I, it brings me back to a moment in the locker room, actually, this year, where after those early losses, we saw Dante Hightower really communicating pretty heavily with a lot of the other defensive players, a lot of the young players, even some of the veterans who hadn't been around as long, like Lawrence Guy. So it did seem like after those early losses, the Patriots 
defense and their defensive players knew that that communication was going to have to get better throughout the season because it just really wasn't there early. So I think, you know, defensive leaders, guys like Dante Hightower, guys like Kyle Van Noy, weren't simply relying on coaches to communicate what they had to do. They really knew that together they were going to have to form as a unit and work together to, you know, get some of these more complex schemes down. And I, I think that, you know, it might not have worked immediately, but it certainly was effective by the end of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I that's a great point because I remember those conversations and also being healthy. I mean, that helps everybody, but especially a young group where it's largely the same personnel from a year ago. But you look at Adam Butler, Dietrich Wise, second year guys, they're right. going to need time to hone those different timings and the stunts and everything they're working on. Danny Shelton and Adrian Klamer in first year in the system. So, you know, they're guys that naturally we're going to develop as the Patriots tend to do and get better over the course of the season, but also just as individuals because where they are in their career or in their time in New England. So I think the coaching was a little bit better. They were naturally going to develop and the fact that they were able to stay together for largely the entire season right. played into, as you just said, kind of peaking at the right time. And against, you know, Chargers offensive line wasn't really great. The Chiefs had a very good offensive line, and the Rams was a top five unit all season. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, getting into the offense, just because we barely kind of touched on it, I understand why. <laughs> For good it reason. very interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> but the Patriots' offensive line had another really good game out there, I thought. Uh, Patriots' run game very quietly had, what, like 150 yards, 146 yards, something like that. Sony Four Michelle, and a half yards per carry. Sonny Michelle had the most rushing yards ever by a Patriots player in a Super Bowl. Wow. Yeah, 94 yards, which... Shocked me when I looked at the final the final box score because he was kind of really uh, he wasn't a non factor because he did the Patriots did kind of move the ball pretty well on the ground early in the game and then especially late on that final drive but I don't think anybody came out of this game thinking like man Sony Michelle was was really one of kind of like the standouts but look at the stat sheet yeah what do you have eighteen carries for for ninety four yards and the lone touchdown so yeah that was I mean it really capped off a, a very very solid postseason for him and and for the Patriots kind of run game operation as a whole. And we talked about the Patriots pressure rate of, of 50% in that game. The Rams pressure rate, uh, yeah, the Rams pressure rate was 19.5%. And they really neutralized Aaron Donald quite a bit in this game. I think he only had two total pressures in the entire game. He had a quarterback hit and a hurry. It was like a quarterback toss. Oh my God. <laughs> right, yeah. That. Um, yeah. And then Indominus Sue just had two hurries in the game. Uh, I mean, Aaron Donald, you know, he had his moments, but for the most part, They did a good job of neutralizing a guy who probably is the best defensive player in the NFL. And it's funny because every single week we talk about these guys. And this week, Zach and I have been making the point pretty heavily that we always talk about them, but they never do anything. It's the same thing as kind of Chris Jones and Justin Houston and D Ford last last week or two weeks ago in the AFC Championship game. And then it was, once again, this week against the Rams, we're like, well, Aaron Donald is so good that he'll probably (laughs) still make his impact. And, I mean, he had a decent game, but... Really, all in all, he didn't make a giant impact, especially in pass rush. Yeah, at least from I, I haven't gotten uh, a chance to rewatch the entire game yet, but we, at least from watching it live, it seemed like Indomik and Sue was making more kind of flash plays, standout plays than than Aaron Donald. I don't really remember a an Aaron Donald moment other than the one you just mentioned where he threw Tom Brady to right. the ground. Indomik and Sue made a couple plays where he just laid out some people uh, near the line of scrimmage. The the Rams defense overall. Played well. I mean, if you hold the Patriots' offense to 13 points, that's that's a solid uh, solid day at the office for for the Rams' defense. Yeah. I thought they were really physical. I thought Nickel Roby Coleman actually played pretty well. Um, other than he he had a, uh, a, a penalty early in the game, he let up another catch. But overall, he was pretty solid. Marcus Peters really shut down Chris Hogan. Yeah. So overall, it was it was a solid day for the the um, the Rams' defense as well. But you didn't see them making those kind of game-altering, game-wrecking plays like you've seen Aaron Donald make in so many games this season. And, I mean, I, I thought personally that was their number one priority on offense going into this mm-hmm. game, was to just mm-hmm. not let Aaron Donald kind of completely ruin your, your evening. And, and he didn't. So I Patriots have to chalk that up as a win. And I know we all talk about them separately and attempt to give them their due, but I, I don't know what more to say about the interior of this line or the right. offensive line as a whole. Like, yeah. these guys are just bleeping good. They're, you know, they're, they're just really, good. really, 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 really good. good. And it, it speaks to Donald. I mean, I think just like we talked about, there's kind of a hidden presence and impact for Dante Hightower on the Patriots defense. You know, Donald did more in there affecting runs mm-hmm. or sending them in certain directions than you would see in the stat sheet. But, you know, Shaq Mason was the best guard in the NFL this year. You know, you go by PFF grades or just the eye test or anything else. 
he was outstanding. David Andrews has been one of the best centers in the league for quite a while. Joe Tooney, you know, rose up to that level, particularly in pass protection. And these are young ascending guys who have played together for a long time. So I think the conversation needs to start in reverse where, you know, Bill, of course, is always going to give the rundown and everyone is, you know, the 72 Dolphins on Wednesdays. Oh, Aaron Donald can do this. Even Leonard Williams with the Jets. Oh, my God, look out for the Bills. But, hey, listen, you, they need to watch out for the Patriots' interior line because it might be the best in the league. And the Patriots have shown time and again they're not going to let a single defender, be it a Donald, be it anywhere, anyone really up front, affect the game the way they typically do. And now that they have an offensive line that matches up as, with anyone else in the league, they, they almost have, don't have to give as much help as they have in the past to scheme you know, their way to eliminating those kind of players. And that's an interior offensive line that all should be back here next season in New England. It, yeah. We might see some turnover on the, on the tackles, which we can get into much more right. in later episodes once we dive into the, uh, the offseason. Man, the offseason's here. It feels kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, it is weird. very odd. It's, it's, yeah. it's I, strange. Um, We've been going basically full speed since, what, like late July when, when training camp started? Yeah. Now it's... Yeah. I mean, obviously, with the NFL so good at making themselves a, a basically a, an eleven month year where they have kind of a, a big tentpole event, so we'll be we'll be at the combine in a couple of weeks. But it's going to be strange going back into to not just like covering this Patriots team on a, a sort of laser focused basis for every single day. Before strange. before we get out of here, well, first thing, I mean, Julian Edelman did, did have a very good game. In the, oh yeah, in this game. he uh, a lot of it was done in the first half though, which is I think why some people might have had a problem with the MVP. I still would have given it to Edelman. He he was the most productive offensive player, and really to some degree, I thought that Hightower, Van Noy, and Gilmore all sort of canceled each other out. Mm-hmm. Edelman was far and away the Patriots' most valuable offensive player in that game, and. I mean, Hightower was great. The two sacks they made, neither one of them was like a game-breaking play. Gilmore's interception was the game-clenching play, but outside of that, and the forced fumble, like there just wasn't enough there. I think that I, I had no problem with giving Edelman uh, the MVP in that game. But uh, Andrew, this was your first Super Bowl you covered, so how was yeah. the overall experience for you? I love it. Uh, you yeah. know, I'm tired as <laughs> blank, uh, but it was fantastic. And I, I think you know personally, not that anyone cares, but it brought the best out of me, which made you know the experience because you're here for work purposes right. so much better. But I mean, going out and hanging with you guys and everyone else in the B was yeah. just a blast. And then you get to game day. And, it, it, it took a while to settle in, but once the kind of lights go down or they're rolling yeah. out the flag, it's just like, oh my God. You know, <laughs> I've been on my caps the last 20, 25 years watching this game. Now I'm in the press box and you're still kind of removed. Like you can't hear what's going on in the right. field. It's a very different experience being in the stands, mm-hmm. uh, but you're still there. And to say that was just unbelievable. So I loved it. Uh, I would love to do it again, uh, <laughs> which isn't to say I'm rooting for the Pats, but it's it was just uh, something, you know, I, certainly six weeks ago, I just did not think was a possibility for them. Uh, and I think that was fair based on where they were. But it's a credit to them and everything they did. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a great game, but it was a hell of a ride. Yeah. And one, one thing we should probably touch on before we, we turn this off, uh, another player who did play a, a very good game yesterday who might have played his last game yesterday, Rob Gronkowski, mm-hmm. yeah. had w- was very productive early in this game, very productive late in this game, made probably two of the biggest catches in the game to set up Sony Michelle's touchdown. He hasn't said anything. We asked him. We asked him probably about fifteen times after the game <laughs> with whether he's going to retire or not. I'm surprised he didn't throw one of us out of the club. Like, <laughs> just like get out of here, stop Seriously. asking me, let me. Party. I think he. Yeah, I think we we were fortunate that we caught him on a, yeah. a very very happy moment. But he said he'll make it. He'll make that decision in a week or two. Right now, he's basically just going to party. He said Bill Belichick was coming out, oh, yeah. so then you know it's going to be a good party. <laughs> but I mean, of of I am of the the mind that regardless of how he played in this game this was going to be his last yeah. game right. as a Patriot. And I think him having the performance that he did, being able to be such kind of an integral part of another Super Bowl title, I think that just sort of solidified it to him. And that's just specu- speculation on my part. Again, we haven't heard anything from Gronkowski himself, and all the various reports have been kind of contradictory, and, and they've been a little bit all over the place. So we won't know for sure for a little while, but... I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I thought this was Gronkowski's last game. I would be surprised if, if he's back in training camp next year. I think to some degree the three rings helps in this situation too because like, I think this modern team was going to be compared to the 2001-2004 team regardless. Yeah. And now it, it does stack up. Each team, and obviously Tom Brady crosses over and Bill Belichick crosses over, but each team now has three rings. So Rob Gronkowski should be considered, you know, 
just as great of a Patriot, and obviously he will be because he's one of the most talented Patriots of all time, but just as great of a Patriot as the Mike Vrabels and the Ty Laws and all those other guys who won three rings. So you're not kind of fighting for your place in Patriots history anymore. You've matched all those older players. And now, yeah, I, I think that you can move on at this point. And I know that that's probably not the top thing that Rob Gronkowski is considering, but his play obviously did take a step back this year. Uh, it certainly increased once the playoffs came around. But for him... I don't just I don't really know what else is in it for him to to keep playing at this point. Uh, if he's not going to be the same player, if he wants to take a load off his body, if he wants to get into some other aspect of life, whether that's wrestling or acting or whatever, now is the time to do it rather than waiting a few more years and becoming Antonio Gates for seven more years. Basically, retire at the top of your game and move on now. That's yeah. what I would probably do. And even taking the historical stuff aside, I think if you were giving him the opportunity to write a reasonable but kind of dream ending, that's it. Like yeah. Zach, you mentioned, just key conversions were basically the Patriots had to get away to get him one-on-one on the linebacker, and they finally were able to do that twice. That's when he made both of those catches, brings him down into the red zone. It was vintage Gronk. Like, you know, with all the multiple back surgeries, the multiple concussions, knee issues, he's got that big arm brace that makes him look like a robot. Right. It seems like he would, he would easily walk away. Yeah. You mentioned the three rings. You know, few people on planet Earth have had a better NFL career. He might be the greatest tight end ever. The only thing that gives me pause and this is even acknowledging during the season it was reported this has been one of his more trying years, injuries and other things included, is the fact that he said at the end this was, I think, the most enjoyable, that might not be the right word. Most satisfying. Most satisfying year. So I think that is naturally like most, you know, satisfactions that we have tied to kind of the struggle that came before it. And I don't know that that would be worth it to him to go through a whole other training camp, a Mm preseason, inevitably get hurt, miss a couple games, and come back to the postseason because there's never any guarantee of that happening. Of course, as we hear are for their fourth Super Bowl in five years and third that they've won. But, you know, for him, if there was a way for him to transition, maybe not skip training camp, but miss a lot of it. And, you know, they were able to figure out a place financially where he wouldn't take up as much of the cap because he's obviously not the same player he once was and still be able to contribute late in the season. This sounds, of course, all like fantasy. That's the only way I could see him entertaining this because, again, he's coming off his most satisfying year. Why would you want to let that die when you're only turning 30? Brady's going to be back. Belichick's, of course, going to be here, well, we presume. Uh, and it's just that was the only thing that gave me pause, but I'm, I'm probably 90, 95% sure that he's going to call. And plans. honestly, when you look back at this season 5, 10, 15 years down the road, what are people going to remember about Rob Gronkowski? Oop, I'm knocking stuff over on our table. <laughs> what, are, what are people going to remember about Rob Gronkowski? Are they going to remember that he was – not really that good for most of the season or that he was awesome in the playoffs that he had yeah. three right. really really good playoff games that really were kind of a throwback to to the Gronk that we hadn't seen all season I think the lasting memory of of this season for Rob Gronkowski down the road is going to be him hell hauling in a catch over over triple coverage late in the Super Bowl to mm-hmm. basically set up the the game winning score for the Patriots it's not going to be him kind of hobbling around in, in a, a game against the, the Packers or whoever in, right. in Week 7. I think this is, like you said, this is the exact way. If I were Rob Gronkowski, and who knows where his exact priorities lie, but if you want to go out on top, this this is going out on top. It's going to be very, very, very difficult to replicate this kind of scenario again in any mm-hmm. future seasons. So I, I don't know. It's It's his call to make, but... That that's that's where I would lean if I was him, and that's yeah. where I do think that he is leaning, having obviously gotten no real confirmation on it from him. I do think the Brady factor might play a part, though. If Brady is like, "Yo, dude, come back," are we? Are we? He, that's a, he might. Are we he might just be the, like, "Yeah, okay, I'll come back." Are we dissecting the Instagram now? Oh, I, I didn't even actually <laughs> oh, see that. I've been sleeping all day, um, <laughs> or I slept for most of the day. But I, I do think that there's something there where Gronk is so tied into Brady. The fact that he would refuse to be traded because he only wants to play with Tom Brady. Well, also, let's be clear, he was going to go to Detroit. True. So I would, I would refuse <laughs> a company trade, too. True. We have M Live by out there. I'm sure they're fine people, but I'm not moving. Um, but, no, you're right. That was, I, that was a reason for the trade. I do you think there's, there's something there. But when I think about that, too, the, the contract plays a part, too, because I, if the Patriots are going to ask Gronk to take a pay cut then he might just be like, no, screw you guys. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to do that. And is it worth, to pay, worth it to pay him as much as they are? Could be. It all depends on what how Bill views him and everything. But I don't know. I, I, I would probably retire if I were him, but I don't think it's as set in stone as, as everyone might think it is. But 
I got one last yes. thought because I kind of introduced the concept and now I, I figured out a way to frame it. Gronk uh, retires. Mm, it yes. does as we all expect him to do and enjoys his time away. It does go to training camp because who would ever want to do that in July and August? I mean, he's kind of basically sitting out drills as it is. Right. Week eight or nine rolls around. They're like five and three or <laughs> six and two or something. And the tight end who they're going to draft is hurt or not coming along. Right. He gets a call. It's Tom saying, hey. <laughs> Just come back. The old the gunslinger. Re- back for one last the, ride. The rest of the league is going to be pissed. <laughs> yep. Let's do this. Let's yep. get one more. We'll have seven, and we can party for the rest of time. <laughs> and if I'm Gronk, I go, what else am I doing in November? I don't know if he skis. I mean, of course, he can go to California. He can do whatever he wants. Right. But, you know, he's around the Buffalo area and, you know, all this different stuff. But if I'm him, I just I feel like that call might be irresistible. And you've seen other veterans, you know, not in the same circumstances, but kind of come back for one last ride midseason. Right. He knows the offense. The dude's going to stay in shape. He's only been doing push-ups since he was a fetus. So, <laughs> you know, I, that's a scenario where I wouldn't bank on it. I'm not. It's too, you know, beyond speculation, but that's where I could see maybe well, happening. As someone who will be covering that Patriots team, as both of you will, I'm probably rooting for that scenario because <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. And he was he was awesome post-game. I mean, he's always... He was so, awesome all week. This yeah, was a great yeah. Gronk week. He great just seemed... Gronk. Which kind of leaned, kind of pushed me more toward toward the retirement yeah. angle because on one hand, you could say, look, he's having so much fun. Mm-hmm. Like, why wouldn't he want to keep doing this? Right. But I, I viewed it more as... I'm just kind of soaking this in for the last time, really enjoying yeah, it, right. and then I'm going to kind of ride off into the sunset. So yeah, I agree. we'll see. Well, I'm assuming we'll get some sort of word on this within the next couple of weeks, mm-hmm. but but yeah, at, at this point where I stand, I, I would not be surprised in the slightest if we do not see, if we have seen the last of Rob Gronkowski. For sure. We'll keep it on Nest.com for all of your Patriots coverage. Andrew, where can people find your stuff? Uh, MassLive.com slash Patriots or on Twitter at underscore Andrew Callahan, C-A-L-L-H-A-N. All right, and you can follow me on Twitter at Doug Kide. You can follow Zach on Twitter at Zach Cox Nessen. We will be back with some off-season stuff, but until then, keep it on Ness.com.